Welcome to episode eight, Ocho of Rail Talk. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm an ownership advisor at West Point Thoroughbreds. This is going to be an all jockey episode. We got Ramon Dominguez coming in a little bit. We also paid a visit to Bobby Montano and his new show, Small, on Broadway or off Broadway. And my co host, John Green, the size of a jockey. That's right, except I, God knows I don't have the weight of the jockey. That would, that would be a little too much. Jonathan Green, General Manager of DJ Stable. And uh, what a great week of racing, Joe, from last weekend up in Canada to this coming weekend up in, in, in Saratoga. It is chock full of great racing. Welcome to another episode of Rail Talk. If you're watching on YouTube, please like this video and subscribe to our channel as we strive to keep bringing you this consistent, honest, transparent, and mwah, delicious industry content. Rail Talk is sponsored by Facing Tipton. In 2022, Facing Tipton launched its online sales platform, Facing Tipton Digital. The platform allows users from all over the country and around the world even to buy and sell horses without moving the stock from the farm, training center, or racetrack to a sales facility. And they got approximately $10 million in gross sales generated during Facing Tipton's gener- D- Digital's first year. It's become one of the leading online sales marketplaces for thoroughbred breeding and racing stock. And John knows that there's a big digital sale coming up. John, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, Joe, I mean, it, it's it's chock full of a lot of turnkey horses, horses that have been running consistently, hitting the board consistently. Uh, and, and if you want to have a horse that's instantly a possibility for return on investment, this coming up, this online sale is place to go. Um, I, my understanding is there's going to be you know, 50, 60 entries in the sale. Um, I know, Joe, that we have about a dozen horses, um, you know, ranging from graded stakes performers like Catamasto, Coinage, and Mrs. Green, um, all the way to two-year-olds like Anna Jam and Fumble Ruski, and, uh, you know, and, and many, many others. But um, we tr- are just trying to make room for our two-year-olds coming in. And that's why, you know, we're, we're putting some of these horses in the online sale. But I got to tell you, Fazig has just been kicking ass when it comes to the online sales. And the reason why we chose this one and not the actual bricks and mortar sale that did really, really well, um, you know, recently is, is because we didn't want to have to pull the horses out of training. So all these horses are in training. They're sound. They're going to have the x-rays they're going to have the scope reports uh, to prove it. And it's just a wonderful way to have people come in, buy a horse and uh, really, if they pay for them, run them immediately. Yeah, no, it's a great platform. And like you said, turnkey. Buy a horse. You can race them next week, potentially, if you want to. And I just wanted to mention two other big sale dates coming up later on the calendar. September 26th is the California Fall Yearlings and Horses of Racing Age in Pomona, California. And October 23rd through the 26th, the Kentucky October Yearling Sale in Lexington at Newtown Paddocks. Check out both of those catalogs online. And we'll see you at the Facing Digital sale. I've been looking forward to this for a while. I feel like I'm the only person who was not interviewed or talked to this guy. He is a Hall of Fame writer. He was one of my favorite writers of all time. And he's just a great ambassador for the sport. Always has a smile on. Ramon Dominguez, welcome to Rail Talk. Hi, Joe. Thank you so much for having me. We're so glad to have you. And, you know, I just I wonder, you know, what it's like for you these days at Saratoga compared to when you were riding, because it was, you know, you walk through the crowd at Saratoga as a jockey. You know, everybody comes up and wants autographs. But you're one of these guys that's like, I think, arguably as popular, if not more popular today than you were as a jockey. Just what's it like at Saratoga these days compared to when you were a rider? Well, I certainly enjoy very much going to the track, and uh, I feel like it's such a big family, whether it is the actual racing family or the fans, as you said. So uh, most of the time they do recognize me, and they want to maybe talk about a good ride or a bad ride that I gave a horse. So I <laughs> uh, just talk about racing in general. It, it is a, a great time. In in terms of uh, the difference between when I was riding, obviously it's something that I greatly love, and Saratoga doesn't get any better. At the same time, there is a great amount of pressure while you're riding there because it's a short meet and it's so so competitive a win makes a difference in the standing so i feel like the competitiveness and how difficult the meet is in some ways take away the fun if that makes sense of riding the race and enjoying the race because you have a job to do so now i am able to go and relax and enjoy the race and uh, it's a uh, different and, and very very much uh, enjoyable in a different way 
and and there's a huge weekend coming up with with the Travers. And I know that you were one of the, you won on Alpha. What was that like winning in front of that kind of a crowd on on arguably the the biggest race day in in New York? It was great. I mean, that's a day that I will certainly remember forever because we had a one day prep race on Alpha, and then uh, coming into the race, I mean, he's a favor, but turning for home. John, I didn't feel too good about my chances of winning. And in fact, I was pretty sure that I was not going to win the race because I felt like my horse was giving me all he had. And along came a horse on the outside, ridden by Junior Alvarado, that actually pushed me because when my horse felt him, he just kind of gave me that extra kick and was able to get up at least to the heat. Uh, so that's one thing that a lot, of, a lot of people watching the race don't realize. And I was saying extremely aggressive on top of the horse because I was already, I kind of exhausted all my uh, tools, so to speak, uh, getting after the horse. And I feel like he just was giving me all he had. But when this horse came and appeared, um, the horse responded much better than anything that I could do on top of him. So at that point, I was sort of a, a passenger. And I was very pleased with the fact that we got close enough. I passed the wire and I asked David Cohen, the other jockey who, who I did hit it with, what do you think? And neither of us knew because we were kind of far apart. And uh, we, I want to say that we were both very happy to see that we did hit it because it could have gone the other way where we would have lost by a nose. And uh, it was great to win the race, even if it was by the heat. You know, one of the things I loved about you as a rider, A, you were always in the right spot. I feel like you always were in good position. You didn't, you know, strangle horses back like a lot of jockeys do. But B, I felt like you never panicked. Like, even if you would get into a box, there would just was no panic in you. Was that something that came naturally or was that something that you had to work on to be able to stay calm even when you're in those tight situations? Yeah, it's definitely something that evolved with time and with experience. And um, I was no that type of joke in the beginning. And um, I feel like when, uh, and this is something that uh, is probably becoming redundant now, or redundant that I am talking about this so, so much. And it's the fact that the ability to get to uh, relax the horse and to listen to the horse. And that's something that I um, was able to tap into that the last half of my career, at least. And so while you get a horse to relax because you're listening to them, um, you have the ability also for the horse to be reserving his energy as much as, as possible. And that also allows you to then turn it for home, even if it looks like, wow, you have nowhere to go. You are surrounded by horses. You're not really in an ideal position. As a jockey, you have a great sense of uh, confidence and trust that no matter what happened in front of you, you're going to get through. And it's an awesome feeling. And it's not something that is going to happen if you are in the same exact spot, but after having to really work hard to get to that position, if that makes sense, because now... You need everything to happen correctly. You need that hole to open in the right place, in the right time, because you are kind of already getting after your horse and your horse is kind of trying pretty hard. But it's uh, not the same when you are very handy because you reserve the energy. That is an incredible feeling that you're like, I don't care what happens in front of me. I'm going to win this race. And on, obviously, honestly, even if it sounds a, a khaki statement, that is absolutely how you feel when you have done your work and the horse has uh, relaxed throughout the first part of the race. Right. Now, that's got to be an awesome feeling when, when you know you have horse under you and, and you're just waiting for that moment to spring them. Uh, it, it's got to be wonderful. I have to ask you, Ramon, do you, in, in your day, you know, you had such a great jockey colony, no matter where you rode. It, was, it seemed like that there were top riders, Hall of Fame riders that you were always riding against. Would you say that any of the current riders right now at, at Saratoga you think are going to end up in the, in the Hall of Fame? Oh, wow. I mean, right now there are um, uh, quite a few Hall of Famers riding, and uh, they're riding against a bunch of future Hall of Famers without any doubt. I mean, it is incredible. And it's funny because you talk sometimes to people who cherish the history of the sport, the era of the, even the Arcaros, or perhaps the Angel Cordero, Cordero and, and Lafitte Piquet and Jorge Velasquez. And, and they sometimes say, well, you know, racing or the jockeys are not as good as they were back then. I will argue with that and say that 
each and every era has brought uh, incredible jockeys who bring a different set of skills and they are good in different ways. And uh, right now we have a jockey colony that is exceptional. It's amazing. I mean, so many good jockeys and they absolutely have elevated the skill of riding, the mechanics of it, uh, the riding in a way that collectively that none of us did in the past. I mean, you will have the Angel Corderos, which are standalone. They are in a league of their own uh, in terms of uh, the style and uh, how well they look on a horse. But uh I mean, right now you have on average any jockey or most jockeys on these big racetracks, whether it is New York or California or Florida, uh, they look amazing on a horse, but they also ride a good race. One thing I wanted to ask you about, I remember as a, as a hardcore New Yorker, you sticking around in the winter at Aqueduct. That could not be easy, man. Like I, everybody, everybody leaves for the warmer climates down in Florida. You wanted to stay, I think, to be closer to your family. But just give me some of those, some of those memories of, of having to ride through the brutal winter in Aqueduct. Well, um, the choice of uh, staying at Aquilo is something that it wasn't by by luck or it wasn't something that we just randomly thought about staying in, in New York. It was something strategically thought out uh, between my agent, Steve Roshan, and I because we came to New York actually for the winter, a couple of winters, and then we'll go back to Delaware. And then when the time came, the time came where it wasn't our decision any longer to stay in New York. We had to stay in New York. And, um, however, Joe, the first time that we stayed for the summer, um, I remember hearing from so many different people that, oh, you will see it's not the same when the New York jockeys come. And I think historically that was the case where even jockeys as amazing as Richard McGlory, the opportunities that they received after the winter meet was over was not nearly the same, and therefore they could not sustain the same business. Um, having said that, in my case, I had a very – a, a business that was made up from so many different trainers, uh, claiming trainers and trainers that have stake horses. So therefore, that gave me the opportunity to continue to ride at a high level and, and win consistently. And uh, so when it comes to staying in New York in, New York in the winter, I mean, this sounds uh, a little um, yeah, funny, but it's the truth that it is a lot warmer when you win, you know. And um, the horses were great. And in, actually, in contrast, when I would look at the races in Florida, um, the competition was pretty tough in terms of uh, races evenly matched. I, and in New York in the winter, especially, I was riding most of the time the best horse in the race. And in Florida, the process did not compare. And yes, we I didn't do this because of the money, but certainly at the, at the end of the day, uh, the money was very important. So um, I felt like uh, it wasn't a big sacrifice to stay in New York in the winter to endure the call because I was uh, um, compensated very well, not only financially, but also with the horses that were able to compete even in the summertime. And Ramona, I mean, just to piggyback on what Joe was saying, it had to be difficult to, to wake up sometimes in the morning when it was below zero and, and get on those horses. And and just the the, the day-to-day grind that uh, jockeys have to go through. There's been a lot of talk recently about mental health and um, trying to do things in order to help jockeys, whether it's increasing weight allowances um, or giving them opportunities to talk to therapists. But mental health is, is of utmost importance. What do you think needs to be done in order to improve that uh, that aspect? Yeah, in terms of what needs to be done, um, there is so much to talk about that it will not be fair. And honestly, I could not give you a straight answer on that because I feel like there are so many de- different areas that we can cover or we can also include in this mental health. I'm extremely happy that I want to say for the first time, this is something that is being talked in uh, in our sport. I was able to be there present and listen to the panel and, and the people who were speaking at the National Museum of Racing Hall of Fame with this meeting that was uh, organized by HISA and by the Jockey Skill. And it was a... Uh, uh, Amazing to hear the jockeys firsthand talk about the difficulties that they have gone through. And it's something that all of us in some way um, have gone through these difficulties. I mean, it's a such a tough sport. Um, when it comes to being a jockey, it is easy to see how challenging, how demanding it is physically. Um, but if I have to sort of compare the mental aspect and the physical aspect, the physical aspect, is really big time secondary to how 
mentally strong you must become in order to stay in the sport and to to do well. Uh, so that's something that doesn't happen overnight. Everybody sort of tackle that in a different way, but certainly all of us who have been there for quite some time in the profession can recognize that it is so awesome to have uh, support and professional support. And, uh, and that is sort of a, ble- a white canvas that we can create this uh, however we see that is going to fit best the jockeys. Uh, but first and foremost, the uh, opportunity that jockeys have to speak about this and for other their peers to realize, hey, I'm not alone on this. And so-and-so who I look up to, I didn't realize that although he comes across as somebody who is so secure and so confident, I didn't realize that he also had his doubts. And uh, that's something important that we need to put aside this ego and the taboo that comes uh, with the embracing the fact that, hey, it is okay to feel weak at times. It is okay to have doubts. That is in part uh, also necessary in order to uh, stay in your toes or uh, continue to look for ways to evolve. And, and the mental aspect is something that is extremely important. Yeah, and kind of in that vein, I just I, I wanted to ask, you know, what is what's something that you that you miss most about riding, and then what's something that you are really glad to be done with? Whether it, you said like it's the physical aspect, the mental aspect, what do you miss, and then what what are you so glad to be done with as a as a former jockey? Yes, I very much miss, um, and I did in the beginning. I still do. It's one of the few things that I miss. The being in the jockey's room with uh, my friends is something that it, it is really like a second family. Uh, I love going there, talking to the guys, and uh, even talking in the sauna. I don't miss being, going in the sauna, although I didn't go for long periods of time, but it was uh, for short periods of time, it was actually enjoyable to go in there and talk about different things. And uh, uh, I very much miss, and I think that I will always do, and I don't think that there is anything that can quite replace the feeling of um, – being behind horses, as we discussed in the beginning of uh, this call, when you have done your work the first part of the race and you have a ton of horse under you, especially on the grass when things happen so quick, and to the naked eye or to those who are watching the race from the grandstand or from the TV, they feel like, oh, there's no way this horse can get through or things don't look too well. But you as a jockey, you're just waiting for that moment. And when there's this separation in front of you, and you just kind of give the cue to your horse and your horse take off. Oh, my gosh. Going between horses and knowing that you're going to win the race, that is an awesome, awesome feeling. I miss that very much. What, what, what I don't miss so much, um, I don't miss, unfortunately, the risk involved with uh, racing, something that you do not think about it. Um, you learn, you train yourself not to really think about it. You know that it is vivid. It is always there, the, the risk uh, of the sport. You try to minimize it by doing things that are in under your control but at the same time regardless of how careful you are or how um, careful you are about mm, your uh, how you are riding the race there are many things that happen that are unfortunately out of control so i do not uh, miss at all the the risk of uh, getting hurt so yeah Right. No, under, understandably so. I mean, it, it, it's and, and with everything that's been going on lately, uh, not only in New York, but but around the country, it seems like we're trying to get better about making it safer for, for all the athletes that are involved. Um, and, and I'm glad to hear that you're an advocate, uh, you know, to try to make it better for, for riders um, with regard to their physical and, and their mental health. I mean, we really uh, appreciate that. I have one more question for you as an owner. OK, um, you know, we we buy yearlings get them developed, get them ready as two-year-olds when they're about to, to you know, breeze a half mile, five furlongs. We bring in usually a jockey that we think is going to ride the horse. When did you know that a horse was going to be a superstar? Was it the half mile breeze, the five furlong breeze, the first time they, they won a race, the second time? Like, when do you think that light goes on and you go, oh my God, this is a superstar? John, there are, um, uh, in my experience, there are, just a few ho- jockeys who have a very good opinion while getting an exercise in a horse. Uh, and I was not one of them. <laughs> I, uh, yes, I was not one of them. Uh, you're, you're being humble. You're being very yeah, humble. No, it is a truth. It is a truth. I mean, obviously, there are certain horses that are 
extremely talented uh, regardless if they breeze their first quarter of a mile a 3a or a half a mile you're like wow this horse is special and uh, it, it doesn't require for a tremendous amount of talent in terms of the jockey or whoever is on their back but there are jockeys who are able to tell wow this is a horse that uh, is going to develop into a great horse and i wasn't one of them so and even uh, while breezing horses that were even closer to running that they already had maybe a couple half miles or a couple five eights. Um, uh, there are horses who are very forward and uh, they are, as we call it, on the bridle, like taking you. And uh, you get a good idea as to how ready they are or how fast they are. But then there are horses who are very laid back, horses that do just as little as they need to do. And I don't know if there is a, a jockey or an exercise rider that is able to tell wow, this is a horse that is a diamond on the rough. And and if so, there may be certain markers or certain things that they will tell you. I wasn't able to read those. So it wasn't until they ran that you say, okay, well, maybe the horse ran a little green, but you say you, you could tell that there is a huge uh, talent and, and you can't wait to run him back. But um, again, they, I feel like most jockeys will claim that they know when a horse is good. The reality is uh, not many of us uh, is able to tell when they're good, yeah. And there's also the morning glories, the horses that work great in the morning and never show up in the afternoon. You know, that happens. Yo, yes, and there's the morning glories, but also the horses who are, as I said, uh, they do uh, as little as they have to, just sort of lay back and lazy. And it's incredible how in the afternoon they transform themselves where – the gates open and you're like, oh my gosh, this is not the same horse that I've been working out in the morning. So yeah. We, we call those uh, the Joe Biancas of, of horses. <laughs> Let's go through the motions until it's showtime. Let's go through the motions until it's time to, <laughs> until the lights go on. And then, then it's time to exactly. work. Exactly. Now, before we let you get out of here, and I could talk to you all day, Ramon, this is so much fun. I want to mention your work with the racetrack chaplaincy. You're the president of the racetrack chaplaincy of New York. They do a great job with a lot of charitable work on the backstretch in particular. They just had the racetrack chaplaincy brunch, which was a big event, very well attended. Can you just talk a little bit about how you got involved with them and then just sort of what kind of projects that you're, you're most proud of since you, since you came aboard? Yeah, so um, I have been uh, on the board of the chaplaincy for quite some time, actually, while I was still writing. And uh, it's something that um, uh, I quite honestly don't remember exactly how the introduction t- took place, but I, it was a easy thing for me to say and try to learn and then try to help in any way I could because I love the chaplaincy that is an organization that help our bike stretch community in so many different ways. The mental aspect, uh, just as we are trying to do with the jockeys, their um, emotional needs and uh, bringing the word of God and uh, bringing food to them. And and the list is very long. Um, So there was a need, uh, unfortunately, our president um, had to step down. And uh, so that's the reason um, this became sort of organically that I could fulfill that spot. And uh, although there were other people who were more qualified, um, we do have, I felt well in knowing that we have an incredible team that is not just the president, it's uh, this uh, wonderful team. And among them is uh, our chairman, Terry Finley, who is an amazing individual. He has a heart of gold, but also out of the box thinker. And um, so he has been um, coming up with some amazing ideas. And among them, and the one that I say that because both him and I have collaborated on this. Uh, a, we have a promo where we have um, donors who are uh, a, con- continue to to donate. So um, throughout a period of time, three four years, and uh, and that sustainable members have been amazing in terms of providing uh, a great help to our backstretch community through the chaplaincy. And it's something that didn't exist before. So events like the brunch, which is awesome. We love it. We love uh, connecting with people. We brought, we love the uh, money that is, we're able to fundraise through these events. But at the same time, there is no sustainability. Uh, so these sustainable members can uh, uh, do that and uh, free the hands of the people like Chaplain Umberto and uh, our team, Eleanor and Nick Aras and Karen Chavez uh, that are working hard. And before they were sort of juggling too many things. So now uh, we're able to let them do their job while um, we can continue to provide the support that is needed for the backstretch. Um, so I do want to briefly thank uh, 
our great friend Jonathan and his father for uh, their contribution to the racetrack chapel in San York. Thank you. You guys do God's work, and, and it's the least we can do. Uh, you know, you're, you're out there on the front line helping people, and uh, it, it's just a wonderful. You have a wonderful team there, and 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 they they make things happen, which is uh, extraordinary. So it's the least we can do. Thank you. And listen, this is our first first time interviewing you. We would love to have you back on. You know, I know I've always known that everybody loves Ramon Dominguez. You seem so great from afar. It's great to talk to you and have that confirmed. Great writer, even better dude, Ramon. Thanks for coming on with us. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Well, that was fun. Ramon Dominguez lived up to the hype. Like I said, I had never interviewed him before. I just heard great things. And, man, did he did he come through. Love to have him back on the show. Just what a great ambassador for racing. Another great ambassador for racing is Len Green, the head and the chairman of the Green Group. If you're not using the Green Group to help you with taxes, you're probably paying too much. Green Group has over 800 clients in the horse business and land in the Green Group. Know the horse business because they're successful industry insiders, just like John Green, who may know them. That's from some point down the line. They're owners for more than 40 years and have owned some of the top horses in racing and breeding. And they know two things better than most, the horse business and accounting. And in the Venn diagram of those two things, that's the Green Group. Right, right there. And Len consults with potential clients for free. Call them up. He reviews their last returns. If you can't find more savings, he'll tell you you're doing great, but he usually will find you savings. Consultation with Len is also more fun than that. He's a leading voice in entrepreneurship. He taught at the Babson School, and he authored a book called The Entrepreneur's Playbook, and he's owned over 30 successful businesses. Where the hell does he find the time to do all that? Talking with Len is like getting a mini MBA. I still don't know anything about business, but it's not from lack of trying on Len's part. He's always, always willing to share his expertise Very passionate about the game and passionate about saving the industry stakeholders money in taxes. Give Len a call. Check him out at thegreenco.com. And as always, shout out to Len and the Green Group for their sponsorship. Wanted to touch on a couple of results from the weekend before we transition to talking about this coming weekend, which obviously features Travers Day, the second biggest day of racing in America, in New York, excuse me, on the calendar. Uh, the Alabama Stakes was run won by randomized Chad Brown, Philly with Joel Rosario up, Philly by Nyquist. I feel like Nyquist had this huge superstar start, start to his stallion career, kind of tapered off a little bit. So it was nice to see him get that big win. I just love to see a horse just take it to the field going a mile and a quarter. I think it was a little bit of a f- speed favoring track on Saturday. But man, did she run hard and just, you know, never really looked like the lo- a loser in that race. Um, so shout out to the connections of Randomized. She's only run, I think, four or five times, but she really burst onto the scene with that effort. The other big action over the weekend was at Woodbine. It was King's Plate Day. Now, this is John Green's account because he's close friends with Mark Cassie. And Mark Cassie pretty much rules the roost up in Etobicoke, Canada, Ontario. John, what stuck out to you from King's Plate Day? Well, the fact that Mark and his wife, Tina, flew up to Toronto for the weekend, um, you know, primarily for these races, obviously for the Kings Plate, uh, most importantly, um, shows you just how much confidence he had. And even though the betters, uh, you know, had his horses at eight to one and five to one, respectively, um, they ran like they were the favorites. And, And you talk about a horse going gate to wire, Paramount Prince did the exact same thing. Um, in this million dollar race that's now named the King's Plate. It was the Queen's Plate. Um, But Elysian Field is a horse also that I wanted to make mention of because that's a filly that ran second in in a full field of the King's Plate, the million dollar race. And uh, and and she, you know, if it wasn't for her entry mate, uh, Paramount Prince, we'd be talking about, hey, there's another filly that really beat the boys again. Um, That in the hard spun filly, out of a smart strike mare, um, just ran an outstanding race. So overall, it was a big weekend for Team Cassie. We had a couple of horses that that ran in one and and hit the board as well. But I'm just so happy for Gary Barber and his partners and Mark Cassie and his team um, because, as you mentioned, they 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 do kind of rule the roost up in up in Canada. But you have to have the horses to be able to do it, and he's managing these horses just extraordinarily well. He won another um, uh, baby. It was a baby two year old. Uh, turf race for the boys and he put two fillies in there and they ran one two against the boys also so mark knows what he's doing when it comes to campaigning horses and he's not afraid to uh, to cross over and have these fillies run against the boys if he feels like that they have the best chance to win there well how about the fact that there were 17 horses in the race i never i never seen that before i never seen more than 14 horses in the king's play i could be wrong but it seems like they're going the way of the kentucky derby and just expanding that gate every year it, it seems no? like it and and you know joe they announced that this was the um, the highest handle 
of a king's plate, queen's plate day that they ever had in history. Over $18 million changed hands um, between the betters and, and the racetracks. And, you know, it's a simple formula for people. If you want to have betters bet, you need bigger fields and you need better fields. And that's what uh, Woodbine offered all weekend long. And that's one of my that's on my list to get tracks to get to is Woodbine. I hear it's a good party up there, especially on King's Plate Day. John obviously has been there a bunch of times. But, yeah, that, that's on my list for sure. And go ahead. I've only actually been there once. I've only oh, been really? there once. And, and they treated us like we were royalty. It was unbelievable. I mean, how you, nice are, they you are royalty. Um, you know, well, I don't yeah, know about that. Only in my own mind. Only in my own mind. Exactly. Just that's just what I think. But um, but yeah, it, it's a beautiful place. Beautiful people. You need to go and get out there. Yeah, that's what they say out. Ut. You need to, you need to get Ooh, out okay. there. Okay, I didn't know where you were going with that. No, you need to get out there. Um, anyway, and uh, you know, kick back a couple of Molsons and uh, and just enjoy yourself. Uh, you know, in a beautiful racetrack. Joe, one of the things that really impressed me, they have not one but two turf courses, and they are both pristine, beautiful turf yeah. courses. No, absolutely. It's 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 really good racing overall. I'm not you know, I'm not crazy about the I wish they, they had a dirt track in addition to synthetic, but overall, like like you say, full fields, decent takeout, and a really good fan experience from what I hear. But another really good fan experience is at Saratoga. This weekend we have a huge, huge weekend. We got the Travers Day car, we got the Travers, the King's Bishop, the Forgo, the Ballerina, the Sword Dancer. But the race of the weekend, John, might be on Friday in the personal ends in. We've got Nest. Clashing with Clary Air. Obviously, Secret Oath is in that race as well. I mean, Nest just looks like an absolute standout to me. I know Clary Air has beaten her before and has run some really big races this year. But Nest just seems like a different animal at Saratoga. I mean, her races from last the last the two races last year and then the one race this year, and she came back in the Shuvi and she was just exploding away in the stretch of that race. Don, I mean, what what are your early thoughts on that? You know, I, I I think that's the big takeaway, Joe, is is that Nest is back, um, and, and I really expected her to have some rust, you know, being off since uh, the Breeders' Cup distaff the uh, you know previous November, and, and it, there wasn't any. I mean, she came into the Shuvi and she wasn't even the favorite, and she ran like she was the favorite for sure. Um, you know, and and it's just really cool that not only is she going to go up against uh, Clarier. But that they're right next to each other. They're you know in the in the five hole and the six hole. So you're going to see from right from the get go how these two uh, horses and how their respective riders, uh, you know, Irad and 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 Joel Rosario, um, how they kind of manage the way the race is going. But Joe, one of the other things I wanted to mention is there's six horses in the race. Three of them are sired by Curlin. So 50 percent of the horses that are in this tough Grade One personal ensign were sired. By Curlin, who again, you talk about horses that just every year just throw good horses and and they seem to get better as they get older and they seem to get better as they go longer. So I wouldn't be surprised if any of the three Curlins, Nest, Clarier, or Idiomatic, the one horse, um, you know, shows up in, in the winner's circle. And you can also make a case for Secret Oath as well. I mean, you could be forgiven for thinking that Secret Oath is a Curlin because she is a chestnut. It's it's I don't really th- think of Arrogate's being chestnut i think i just blew up john's spot because he thought he said secret <laughs> was my car <laughs> he did a whole other take just for me to bring it back up <laughs> just for me to bring it back thanks thanks <laughs> and where was david o'rourke in the hospital joe <laughs> every, every every piece of content on this show is in danger of being on the show you should know that by now john we're eight episodes in you should know the protocol but there's a bunch of other good racing, too. we got going to have the Elite Power Gunite rematch, I believe, in the forego. I think we might have some short fields, but some really nice races. Um, we're going to see if New York Thunder can do it again in the H. Allen Jerkins. What do you run? Like a 114 buyer in the Amsterdam. Um, we'll see if yep. we'll see if he can do do that again. So it's looking like a short field in the Sword Dancer, which made me think, where is up to the mark? And I went and looked on Equibase, and he has no no works in his last 60 days. I haven't heard anything of him being injured, but he's yeah, he was the clear, clear runaway favorite for champion turf mail. I thought was a pretty strong contender for horse of the year as well. Um, it's, it's disappointing not to see him racing throughout the throughout this summer and then potentially maybe in the fall. The other thing is, is in the Travers, we're going to get something that we rarely get, which is all th- the winners of all three triple crown races clashing in the Travers stakes. I mean, that's. That's a pretty big deal. It doesn't happen often. It's happened five times in the last 45 years. Interestingly enough, all five times, none of the th- horses that won any of the Triple Crown races won the Travers. 
It's been an outsider really? every single time. Last time, yeah, last time it happened was in 2017. It was always dreaming, cloud computing, and Taproot. And neither of them, even none of them, even came close. I was with the year West Coast one. I, I think you know maybe Taproot was fourth, and like always dreaming was eighth or ninth, and cloud computing was eighth or ninth. So they never even come close. This year, obviously, we've got Archangelo, National Treasure, and Mage. But I think you know Forte might be favored over all three of them. I, I you know there's so much buzz behind him. I think another interesting horse in there is Scotland for Bill Mott, who's just had an unbelievable year. He was a real progressive horse. He won the Curlin Stakes last time out. I think he could sneak sneak up and and take down all three of them. I you know we got a really nice race I think in the Ballerino percolating as well with Echo Zulu and Society for Steve Asmussen. Caramel Swirl is a really nice horse for Bill Mott. Good Night Olive was obviously the champion last year. Matarea, multiple Grade One winner. So I don't think we're going to have a bunch of huge fields, but quality wise, John, I mean this this card really is is. I think other than Belmont Day and the Breeders' Cup days, second to none in all of America. But just just to circle back, I wanted to get your thoughts on, on the Travers. And, you know, if you did have to go with one of the three Triple Crown race winners, who would you lean to? Well, that, that, that's that's a great question. And I didn't realize that when when the three foes go up against each other, that it's only happened a few times, which makes sense. But that none of them have, have won. Um, that really That really surprised me. But, Joe, there's going to be – Based on the projections, there's going to be five different grade one winners in this race, five different grade one winners. And we talk about sometimes the watering down of some of these races. This is not one of them. I mean, there's going to be a tremendous number of horses. You mentioned each winner of the Triple Crown is going to be in there. Um, And then you have Forte, who has won seven of his last nine races. Um, And and Tappet Trice, who won the Bluegrass and was, you know, was arguably one of the one of the tough horses for the Kentucky Derby. Um, Scotland, I'm not so sure, only because history is against Scotland. And, and, you know, A is going into some really deep waters. But B, there hasn't been a gelding who has won the Travers in at least 25 years. Um, so history is, is against him um, just because he doesn't have any gonads. He may have John, go-go, John, but no gonads. Digging deep for that angle. Digging yeah. Real deep to find an angle. Real deep. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not going to, that's not going to stop me. Although I did say I related to funny side because he was a gelding on prior episode. So now I think I'm required to, to bet Scotland as well, just to keep it, keep it consistent. Like I said, this is a very jockey centric show. Ramon did a great job. He's a great ambassador, ambassador for the sport. But there's another great ambassador for the sport who wasn't a successful jockey like Ramon Dominguez is, but he's become successful in other areas of life. Bobby Montano, who has a hit off Broadway show called Small, and it's all about him not being able to achieve his dream of becoming a jockey, despite that being his passion and everything that he built his life around. It's about adjusting and finding a new path in life. It's it's a great show, and it's it's I think it's getting people interested who wouldn't normally be in coming to the track. I mean, John, what are your thoughts on the show? Well, I, I didn't realize until you know we started talking about it that that Robert you know not only has 40 over 40 television credits to his to his uh, name but he was also in the producers and chicago so the guy can dance too i mean he's he's really a multi um, faceted individual and, and joe he was not only the star of this show but he also was the writer of the show so you know it came from the heart it was his story that he's uh, that he's putting out there and it's a story of failure perseverance and how to reinvent yourself and uh, become successful. So I, I give you know the guy all kinds of credit in the world for um, for persevering. And uh, I'm looking forward to going to see the show before it is you know off Broadway uh, on September 2nd. I think is the last date. Um, but it, it's a it's a great story. It's not just about horse racing. It's about the human spirit. Yep. And our our producer Patty Wolf and and her team went and interviewed Bobby for the show. Check out their little peek at Small Off-Broadway. That was kind of the the whole idea of writing this as a one-man show, that I get to do it, and I get to say what really happened and portray these 24 different characters that I do because I knew them so well. The, The grooms, the hot walkers, I mean, without them, you know, they are the heartbeat of that racetrack. Anthony Melfi, thank God for him. He's one of our producers now for Small, but he wanted to do this for the PDJF, for the Permanently Disabled Jockeys Fund. And so July 18th uh, of this year, we had a one night production of Small. 
uh, of which is going to be uh, off-Broadway uh, starting August 12th and running through September 2nd. And we decided to donate all the proceeds to uh, PDJF, which is the Permanently Disabled Jockeys Fund. They need the help and we wanted to benefit them and, and Bobby felt that it was a perfect uh, situation to, to help them out. I couldn't have been more happy with the response. That was like my most frightening audience because whew, if I'm gonna pass the muster, you know, it's gotta be in an in industry-based field of trainers, jockeys, you know, horse owners. Saratoga is it, you know. This is Robert Pineda's whip. And Robert Pineda was very special to me. He taught me how to ride. He took me under his wing. He called me his cousin because he didn't want anyone to mess with me. And so I have magic on the stage. I have Steve Cawthon's saddle. He called me up and he said to me, hey man, I heard you, you're killing it with your show small. I'm sending you a saddle. And, and he said, and you can keep it. And I was like, oh my God, you're gonna, you're gonna make me cry. So my friend Jose Rodriguez, who used to work for Lucian Lauren, who trained secretariat, he said, I'll give you stirrups. So I have Jose's stirrups and straps, Stevie Cawthon's, you know, saddle, Robert Pineda's whip. I think he did a great job and really hits really close to our heart, obviously, for us leaving it and seeing our friends and our colleagues living, you know, the life he tried to, you know, make himself out of being as a jockey, being a tall guy and having the struggles and all the things that he did. Uh, it really, it, it really hit hard, right to the heart. <laughs> Even though this is a solo play, it's never a solo project because it's, there's a lot of people that, that make this run. And that is, you know, yes, my director, Jesse Hill, and the sound designer, Brian Ronan, uh, Jamie Roderick, who does the lights, Christopher and Justin Swader, who do, who's done an amazing job with the set, and, you know, my right arm person, you know, who helps with me in tandem calling the cues and whatnot is Karen Schleifer. I call her Curly. So, I mean, it's, it's never a, a one person show, ever. It's my way of, you know, uh, of doing the racetrack proud because I love the racetrack. That has never left me. All I ever wanted was to be small. Rail Talk is brought to you by TaylorMade. TaylorMade is the worldwide leader in thoroughbred sales, marketing, and horse care. Family owned and operated since 1976. And they have very clear values, which are be honest and transparent, which is what we try to do on this show. That's why I have such a natural marriage. They care for their customers, their team members, and horses like their family. We've seen that firsthand. John especially has seen that firsthand. They deliver smiles through their service, which again, John is seeing firsthand and they have fun while they're striving for excellence. And we saw that when Mark Taylor came on the show, he was a riot. A lot of the Taylor boys are, are great and they have a great team full of really fun personalities. And they always look for a better way to do things. They're always inter innovating and changing on the fly and still not straying away from the core of what they do, which is customer service and doing the best for their clients in racing. I swear we're gonna remember how this contest worked. So we had the offshoot contest from our yearling naming. John's already skeptical. Well, I don't, I don't remember having another contest, Joe. What the hell are you talking about? Is this, is this I, the random the random person part of the... Does this mean you're not sending me the full papers for Change of Jamaica? Are you, are you reneging on that deal? They're in the mail. They're in the mail. I'm sure. I, I would like a headshot too, please. A framed headshot of my baby boy, Change of Jamaica. But... One of, the, one of the little the added incentives for voting on which horse would be named Change of Jamaica is that you, the listener, the viewer, would have a chance to name a horse of your own. And this is a Flame Away filly, Minnesota bred Flame Away filly, John Green. And we got a lot of good submissions, but there was only one. And I think in the end, it was a pretty clear winner. Drum roll, please. John? <laughs> Oh no! Oh, that was not pleasant. That's. <laughs> Jesus. I'll do the drum roll. Closer um, to a drum roll. Anyway, three. the winner is our homegirl Steph 
with burner account. Steph Q justified. Hold on. Let me let me read. Let me read Steph's entire Twitter name real quick because it's 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 a mouthful. And she's it's, it's, it's more than 18 letters. Otherwise, we'd name the horse this. You telling me we couldn't get Steph Stradivarius justify Wooten Arrow pot po mot? It's available. Come <laughs> it's on. Never been used before. <laughs> John, you're on all these boards and stuff. You couldn't get her Twitter name. Uh, well, congratulations, Steph, on being yeah. the, on being the, the 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 matriarch of this Flame Away. And you'll be happy to know, Joe, that this Flame Away filly is going to be trained by none other than Hall of Fame, two time Hall of Fame trainer Mark Cassie, who also trained Flame Away. Oh man, it's all coming together. That's a great name, and also like it just it fits so perfectly because we all kind of got together over Twitter. And God knows there's a lot of burner accounts in this business. You know, <laughs> there are a lot of burner accounts that later were exposed as the person's real accounts. There's plenty of burner accounts still out there. So it's a great name. Obviously, the, the Flame Away connection makes it even better. So shout out to Steph, who's such a huge supporter of ours and such a huge supporter of the show. Uh, we, we, we love you and appreciate you. And I just this is honestly a better name than my name. That's my only beef with this is that. This is a better name than my name. I, it's, I, I, I like your admit. name. Yeah, I like I like that you're called Joe. Is that the name you're talking about? The one that your parents named you? You don't like that? Hey, Patricia, can you tell us some of the other names that were offered? Okay, the final five, uh, if you want those, were Hot Rod Honey, Hot Dish, Cash Stash, Fire Starter, and the winner was Burner Account. Thank you very much. I appreciate much. all the names. Burner Account. Clear, clearly the winner. So hat, hats off to Steph. I think that was the first one we got. And it was just like no one was was ever going to come close. So we're really excited about this filly. I mean, John, you can talk more about her her pedigree and, and you know, what what the plan is for her. Well, basically, you know, she's going to go down to uh, Mark Cassie's farm in, in, a, in a couple of weeks and uh, be there with with the rest of the group of uh, DJ yearlings. Uh, but she's a flame away, like I said, and flame away is, you know, was under the radar and is having a phenomenal uh, first crop already. Uh, and this is from one of the very famous Stronach families, Joe. It, Win Money, My Honey was, is an awesome again, Philly, the mayor. Money, My Honey, the second dam is by Red Bullet. And the third dam is Collect the Cash, who campaigned and ran for the Stronach. So it is just a chock full of really well-bred you know, uh, genes that are going into this filly. And uh, I hope that Burner Account is not only a stake winner, but that uh, we'll be unveiling, uh, you know, a plaque for her in the uh, in the Hall of Fame someday. Wow. Certainly, certainly in the Minnesota Hall of Fame. Set the bar up very high. I mean, it's a Hall of Fame name. It is that's, a Hall of Fame name. For sure. There's no question about it. But I but, uh, just have a new thought. I just have a new name. We should run away redhead. That would have been good. <laughs> Thank this God you're a good producer. This is why we don't let the team members vote. <laughs> this is when Joe and I can be like, idiot. <laughs> exactly. We'll try to upstage Steph here, Patty. Yeah, really, Patty. Let Stay her, in your lane. Let, let her have her moment. Stay in okay. your lane, kid. Naval Hospital. Naval, Naval <laughs> Hospital. That, that, I want, that I want to save. <laughs> <laughs> Naval Hospital is one that I'm definitely gonna gonna reserve. All right, Patty, you got you got to tell the story now. It's I thought the entire hospital was for belly buttons. <laughs> <laughs> and how old were you? You were like 38, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was in 10th grade. <laughs> oh, so it was the year before you were in the music video. <laughs> like just a little younger than 38, 10th grade. Oh, my God. I'm going to look it up right now to see if it's available. No direct matches. I am going to reserve it. <laughs> nice. Well, you should spell it N-A-V-E-L. Please. Please. Just as like a little <laughs> little, little nod. Right. Oh, so like it has, it has like to be Sarah. a cult. It has to be a cult because that way, if it is a stallion, there'll be so many semen jokes. <laughs> That's the way you say a joke, Patricia. <laughs> I just say dumb shit and laugh. <laughs> you don't get this kind of transparency and humor on the other shows. No. I can tell you that. This would all be censored out. <laughs> you had me at semen joke. <laughs> the lesser known outtake from Jerry Maguire. <laughs> 
that's it for episode eight of Rail Talk. Now, we're going to be off for a little bit because Johnny has this fancy European vacation planned while the rest of us are slumming it here back in the industry trying to make this place great. But shout out to John. You deserve a little bit of a break. So our next show is going to be after Labor Day. But in the meantime, what you can do is check out our Breakaway Rail Talk episodes. We've done two of those. It's one of us individually with a single guest, an interview. And on the most recent one, I talked to Andrew Stewart of our new sponsor, Arian Pedigrees. Arian is an absolutely indispensable database and source for pedigrees, sire info, broodmare info, crosses, All that stuff that all of us pedigree nerds love and appreciate that helps us understand the game and its history better. You can find it on Arian. Arian Arian.co.nz is the website. We'll put that up on the screen right now. So shout out to Andrew for coming on. We had a great conversation. He's from New Zealand. So the accent alone is worth tuning in for. And yeah, we had a great time. We'll bring him back on the show a couple of times. We'll do a little pedigree corner segment just because we like him so much and we appreciate Arian so much for coming on as the sponsor for Breakaway Rail Talk. So go check those out. There'll probably be a blooper rail or two in the meantime. When John decides to come back to these shores, we'll probably probably have a couple more things coming out. So there'll be lots of content, but the next full Rail Talk episode will be in two weeks. So thank you to John. Have a great time, buddy. Thank you to our producer, Patty Wolf. Thank you to our associate producers, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Monkinson. Thank you to Ramon Dominguez for coming on and being his incredible incredible beautiful self we'll have ramon back on anytime he's willing to come on what a great dude and what a great ambassador for the game and as also as always also thank you to basic tipton the green group and taylor made for sponsoring rail talk appreciate y'all tuning in we'll see you in two weeks back here on rail talk